good? Welcome to Throwing Stones alongside Ryan Griffin. I'm Matt Basson. And if you don't know by now, you definitely should know. We talk in hoops. And before we get into everything regarding the NBA Finals and Draymond drama and Kerr and Clay at the press conference, got to remind you guys to like and subscribe everywhere you can find us. That would be Facebook, Twitter, TikTok, Instagram, full episodes on YouTube, as well as DetroitSportsNation.com. Ryan, when we last spoke, series was tied at two. And we both predicted that the Warriors would come in and take game three. Well, we were both dead wrong. The Boston Celtics took it to the Warriors in the first quarter and held on from pretty much there. Warriors made a nice run in the third, which seems to be the only quarter where they really want to play their brand of basketball. But Boston smacked them right back down and kept them at double digits pretty much most of the fourth quarter and walked away up 2-1, which is very important, especially for Boston, because in their history of the NBA Finals, when they are tied at one and win game three, they are 5-0. and So it's a good omen for the Boston Celtics out there that they have never lost when it's been a tied series and they win the third game. But we've also seen the numbers as well. Winner of game three in a tied series, 82 plus percent of the time wins the NBA Finals. Ryan, my question to you is Boston's big three better than the Warriors' big three? Because it seems to be that way through two of the three games. Well, who's the third you're including? Marcus Smart? Or yeah. Is it Robert Williams? No, it's, right, it's Mar- Marcus three. Smart is what they're calling their big three, apparently. <laughs> I think so. I just think Jalen Brown's way better than either Clay Thompson or Draymond Green are at this point in their careers. Game one was weird for me. The Sorry, game three was weird for me, the first half especially, because I know the Celtics were up 12 at halftime. It felt like they should have been up a lot more, and the Warriors had – you know, some defensive lapses where they just fell asleep. But I also thought the Celtics made tough shots when the Warriors were playing good defense. So, of course, when the Warriors were just giving up buckets, the Celtics were going to score. And then when it felt like the Warriors had a clue what they were doing on defense, the Celtics were still scoring. And after all that, it was still only a 12-point game. And then they cut to the ESPN broadcast crew and – that Stephen A. even said it twice. He really believed it. He's like, the Golden State Warriors are still in striking distance. And I felt like that was the feeling from pretty much anybody that was watching the game because they knew about these Warriors' infamous third quarters. And it happened again. Though the Warriors went into the fourth quarter only down by four, so they outscored the Celtics by eight in that third quarter. And then the fourth quarter, the Celtics were able to really nut up on defense and then shut down the game the, the rest of the way there for this game and we're going to get into it who didn't play well who did play well one thing that i think is interesting is where after so the warriors took the lead i think it was 83 to 82 after steph curry hit a three and then the celtics got the lead pretty much right back but like after that sequence steve kerr best steph curry towards the end of the third quarter and I, honestly, I don't know why I did that because Steph was cooking. I think he had 15 points in that quarter, 14 or 15, um, up to that point, and he took him out. And I know you're not trying to get him hurt, and I know Steph was in foul trouble, but it's way easier for a guard to not foul somebody. And I think that's part of what we saw in the first half is Steph, who's been good defensively in this series and in the whole playoffs, after he picked up his second foul and definitely after he picked up his third, he was the hands off. <laughs> He's like, no, I'm not doing anything that's going to get me called for any type of foul. And I think that's what led to, in part, the Celtics being able to knock down some easier shots in game three. And with Steve Kerr taking Steph Curry out at that point where he was rolling the best player on the floor by far. It's just not something I agree with. Like, you got to let – to me, I would have had him out there the entire second half and honestly maybe like the entire game. I'm interested to see what the strategy will be for game four. I assume Steph's not going to have two quick fouls like he did in game three. And if I'm Steve Kerr, I'm just like – I'm riding it because now you only have four games left. And – I know it's a little bit trickier now because Steph has whatever's going on with his foot. He said Al Horford got up under him on that four-point play, and you no, know, it's all signs point to he's going to play. I didn't have any reason to think that he'd sit out the game, but if if I'm him, I'm just like you can get your rest in the off season. <laughs> like now's the time where you got to play 
45, 48 minutes if we need you because he's really Golden State's entire offense. So when he's off the floor, nobody else really seems like they can get it going. Clay Thompson did in this game, so it was nice to see a bit of a bounce back game for him. But if it's just those two guys, it's never going to be enough. And everything does start with Steph and Clay's again been hot and cold this entire series. So just because he was hot in game three, that's not something that I'm going to bank on happening in games four and five and six and seven if we get there yeah I'm, I'm trying to remember the timeline of events of when steph took the three started to come down on horford's foot felt it that to me was amazing he felt what was beginning to happen and took his weight off of that foot and elected to just fall instead to the ground land on his thigh i'm sure it didn't feel good but i'm sure it feels a heck of a lot better than rolling your foot rolling your so i'm trying to remember the timeline of events of when that happened compared to when steve kerr took him out obviously the later thing in the fourth quarter when they dove for the loose ball that didn't help matters either but it's i, I don't I, I can't remember when that was compared to when kerr took him out because if that was the reason it makes sense to me anything else it doesn't make any sense to me because this is this is everything for the Warriors. This is what Steph is doing is literally everything for the Warriors. He's averaging over 31 points a game for them, averaging a bunch of assists. He's playing the best defense he can, and it's pretty much some of the best defense he's played in the playoffs in his career. Getting rebounds as well and doing anything possible to try and will his team to victory. And he's not getting it. He's a little bit looking Luka Doncic and the All Scrubs here, where the way Steph Curry is getting lack of help from his teammates. Yes, Clay finally stepped up in Game Three, a big 25 points. Where is Jordan Poole? Where is the Jordan Poole who in the first round of the Western <laughs> Conference playoffs when Steph was coming off the bench and Poole's dropping 25 to 35 points a night for him? Where is that Jordan Poole? He's nowhere to be found. The Celtics defense is absolutely messing him up. Clay, as great as he is as a shooter, he can't handle the rock. And if you are not getting open off of screens and quick shots... The Celtics are right there in your face, and I understand he's a fantastic shooter and he shoots with pressure all the time, but the constant pressure that the Celtics are putting on you, it's really hard to do it if you can't get your own shot, and that's one of the things that makes Steph so magical is the way he's able to handle the rock to get his own shot, get his own drive to the bucket, whatever it may be, while also using the screens that his team sets for him along the way and just never stopping also just has energy nonstop, which has just got to be exhausting. So I want to see, I need to go back and look at that timeline of events because I agree with you outside of that one situation where the, the four-point play happened. If it was around that same time, I understand Kerr pulling him out. If that's not the case, then I don't understand it either, and I'm absolutely with you. Yeah, it was, so it was a little bit after that because that was eventually like a seven-point play because they got the ball back, and then I think Otto Porter hit a three to cut it to, I want to say they cut it to one after that, and then maybe on the next possession or the possession after that, a Steph got a three that gave the Warriors the lead, which is probably ended up being their only lead of the game because the Celtics got on them early, and then, like you said, they, they stayed on them for a very long time, basically to the end of the game, aside from that part in the third quarter, but... Again, I'm still like I'm still riding with my guys. I'm still playing everybody that needs to be played, Steph Curry included. And the quick whistle obviously didn't help him, but they kept him in when he had two fouls. So I thought, okay, this is this is going well. They're gonna let Steph kind of Steph cook, and then he got his three fouls, and they still left him in. And I agreed with you know all of that. <laughs> I thought all of that was great. He picked up the dumb fourth foul on the Marcus Smart foul which probably shouldn't have been the shooting foul, but it was called the shooting foul, and he went to the line and made the free three throws out of it. But I think Steph and Clay and Wiggins and all of these guys, the Warriors, Jordan Poole you mentioned, someone else is going to have to step up, whether in game two where it was uh, B elites a little bit. Draymond had nine points in game two. Looney, I think he had 12 points in game two. So they're going to need to get offense from somewhere else or else the series is going to be over because the Celtics, even when they don't have their offense, they have their defense. And in two out of the four games that we've seen, the Warriors haven't brought, or two out of the three games that we've seen so far, the Warriors haven't brought any defense. So they don't have that to fall back on as much as the Celtics have it to fall back on. And then in this game, you had Jalen Brown playing great. You had Jason Tatum. He still didn't have... Uh, so much luck shooting. I don't believe the shooting numbers were uh, a little bit rough, but uh, he finished with 26 points and he was more aggressive like we talked about before game 
three or after game two and you gave those great stats after a loss here's what jason tatum's doing and we saw a little bit more of that you know i saw him take steph curry directly to the rack a couple times which is something that we called for before the game and it seemed like everything that boston needed to do from their standpoint on offense is things that they're able to get done i think they out rebounded the warriors by 16 or 17 rebounds which is probably if you're going to boil down like the the box score to one thing, which is why this team won. I think that was it. Speaking of, and again, we're going to talk about Draymond, so I guess I don't want to spoil it, but he fell asleep on a couple of box outs where Robert Williams shot it, and then Robert Williams got the ball directly back, and then you watch it on replay, and Draymond just didn't do anything except just watch the ball go up and miss. Williams is able to get it back. He's kicking it out. He's getting fouled, going to the let or just putting it back up, whatever he's doing. But he was really instrumental for the Celtics in winning that game you know, just with his defense, and then I think even with his presence on offense, too, because he was so good on the boards, as were the rest of the Celtics taking advantage of a lot of what I thought was Warriors laziness. Yeah, I, I, I can see that, but I don't want to take too much away from what Boston did, because this game was a Boston Celtics beatdown of a game. The rebounding stats you just said, yes, they out-rebounded them 47-31. to 31. That plays a huge factor. Go along with that are the number of offensive rebounds that were given up 15 for the Boston Celtics. You're getting 15 second chance opportunities there for the Celtics. They completely dominated the Warriors in the paint, 52 to 26. You doubled them up in the paint. So that stat alone, you got all them points right there to go along with a pretty average three-point shooting night, 37%. From deep which seems to be around right around the average for a good nba team these days so the celtics just overall took this game to the warriors they shot really well in the first half almost 60 percent tatum not as best shooting it like you said i think he was nine for 23 but he still finished with 26 points to go along with nine assists so he was getting his teammates involved brown was relentless on his attacks driving to the basket time and time again he was making great passes and when the warriors were giving him that shot he took that shot and he made a few of them so Brown did everything you wanted him to do as well. Marcus Smart, you don't know what you're going to get. Sometimes you're going to get greatness. You got greatness in game one. You got greatness in game three. You didn't get greatness in game two at all. But if Brown and Tatum can continue to be averaging around 27 points a game, that's going to do a lot for the Boston Celtics. And everything we had talked about leading up to these finals, that the Celtics are bigger, the Celtics are a little bit faster, and they're younger, it's it's coming to fruition. And we're seeing it before our very eyes right now, the way that this series is playing out. And the same thing I called for in game one, I'm going to call for in, or for in game two after game one. I'm going to call for for game four after game three. Give me Moses Moody. Give me Jonathan Kaminga. Give me the young guns who have the legs to fight with these Celtics. And they're not small either. They're not, we're not talking about, I'm, I'm telling you to throw out a six foot one point guard out there. I'm asking for some guys that, are, that have athleticism, have that fight, have that hunger. I'm not saying the Warriors vets don't, obviously. But these young legs, you need them. You have them for a reason. Use them. Don't just keep sticking with what's working because guess what? It ain't working. So what's happening right now is you guys are in danger of going back home down 3-1 if you don't make the necessary adjustments. And you can beg and plead for Steph to get help offensively, but you got to do something defensively because what you're doing right now ain't working. And so why not mix it up and throw some of these young up-and-comers that you've got on your team and give them a chance to fight? You gave them a chance in game two. Guess what? You won game two. Maybe it'll work in game four. Yeah, they need something from somebody, whether it's, Kaminga, Moody, uh, or it's a guy who has just a little bit more experience than in Juan Toscano Aaron Anderson, who's been on the Warriors for a few years. And of course, he's not the most talented player, but he's a guy who knows their system, who I'm surprised can't get at least a little bit of run in these finals just to switch something up. And when they're not getting 34 minutes from Draymond and he's taking four shots, like I, I love him, but he was really poor that game and if he's going to play like that his offense is just really going to hurt the Warriors and it's really going to help the Celtics especially in a game like this where he wasn't his best defensively and you saw Jalen Brown and hats off to Jalen Brown because he had a great game but you saw Jalen Brown call off a screen to go one-on-one with Draymond and he's still able to get the bucket and there was a stat floating out in game three when Draymond was the closest defender to the Celtics, they shot 8-12, of 
And again, I just from the eye test, it seemed like they made a tough a, a bunch of tough shots. So I don't think Draymond was just letting them score. But we already talked about a few of Draymond's, you know, defensive lapses, if you will. And I just don't know really what to make of. I still don't know what to make of it. I don't know if it's anything that's indicative for the rest of the series necessarily. I wouldn't be surprised if Game Four came out and just had a totally different feel than what games one, two, and even three were. It feels like the Celtics have something or have something figured out, but we don't, I, I just don't think we know that because this is a Celtics team that we've seen all postseason has just been up and down, right? Mm-hmm. They look like they had something figured mm-hmm. out against Milwaukee and Miami, and then those series ended up going seven games when they probably shouldn't. And now they're in the finals and they're looking like they're playing their best basketball of the postseason. But we, honest to God, we just don't have any idea. I don't even know if they've won back to back games since they swept. They probably have. Since they swept the. Um, oh, no, they did. They won six and seven yeah. against, six and against seven. Milwaukee. Yeah. Against Milwaukee. That's the only one I was thinking of as well. Ryan, did you watch the, the NBA tip off before game three? I did not. Okay. I watched the NBA TNT crew before, right. but not the okay. not NBA so, football. I was so proud because, you know, what have we been talking about every single time we talk about the series is that we don't know what to make of this series. We have This is just such a really confusing matchup to pick. And Mike Greenberg opens up the NBA tip-off exactly the same way, talking to his panel of people and all of them in the same situation we're in, where we don't know for sure what to make of the series. So that made me feel a lot better that we're not just blithering idiots, at least. You got the guys actually on the four-letter network in the same problem that we're sitting in. But I want to get back to, to the Draymond stuff, because it's infuriating. Being a big fan of his as we are, it's infuriating, because he does so much when he's doing it right that it makes life hell for his opponents and it makes life so much easier for his teammates and he had all the talk after game one of coming out with fire in game two and then all the talk leading into boston and having to continue it and then you come out and play this game how are you not ready for this game after everything you've been saying leading up to this game everything after game one knowing what's on the line with the fact that you have a chance to steal home court advantage right back after blowing it in game one and you come out and you lay this type of egg now look it's draymond defensively this man commits more than six fouls every single game I will never say otherwise. I'm not going to pretend otherwise. Getting caught on all of them is a different story. And so getting called for early fouls definitely plays a factor into how you play defense. And if the refs are showing you, and especially a Scott Foster-led crew, and the Celtics are like undefeated or something when Scott Foster... He's like, it's 13-0 now. <laughs> yeah, it's freaking ridiculous. But regardless, <laughs> if you are called for those, heart, for those fouls early on, it does change the way you play defense because you have to. Otherwise, you're going to be out of the game by halftime. But... To talk the game that Draymond talks and then come out and play that kind of game, it just, it hurts as a Draymond fan because I want him to do well. I want him to prove that he that he is everything he says he is. And in the past, he did a lot. But so far in this series, I really think he's hurting the Warriors more than helping the Warriors, Ryan. Uh See, I still don't know. In this game, he definitely hurt the Warriors more than he helped the Warriors. But he definitely helped them more in game two. And I think even in game one, I didn't think he shot horribly. He was like two of 12. I thought the rest of his game was, he, he played fairly well. But yeah, two of 12 is probably going to end up hurting your team. So I'll concede to you on that. In this game, though, this was really, this was really something like on a different planet of terrible. <laughs> Not only did he only take four shots, so he's not aggressive at all, but what that does is that allows whoever's guarding him, whether it's Jason Tatum or Jalen Brown, because what seems to be like the trend now is not putting one of these guys, like one of your best defenders, directly on somebody. You're going to put them on maybe like the worst guy so that they can help off. And you don't have to worry about Draymond shooting at all. So whenever anybody drives, Jason Tatum doesn't have to stay on Draymond Green in the corner. He can come over and help on a Steph Curry drive or Jordan Poole's trying to get to the lane or something else and create way more turnovers that way because you're just not going to be able to guard like Steph Curry one-on-one. So you just get as much help as you can. And having Draymond on the floor offensively allows the Celtics to do that on the defensive end because he's no threat to shoot or score or do any of that. And then in this game, like I said, I didn't think he played horrible defense, 
But they were 8-12 when he was the closest defender, so they were still scoring on him, whether or not he thought the defense was good or not. He wasn't stopping them from getting buckets. And uh, he had a, a couple bad turnovers. I know there's a pass that probably could have been not an easy fast break, but it was definitely a fast break opportunity and one that we've seen them convert time and time again. And he threw it to the point where Al Horford was able to just stick his, like, his paw out there and then grab it, and the Celtics went the other way. And for Draymond, I'm pretty sure he said it on his podcast after the game. Like, he, as much as we thought he got into the Celtics' heads last game, he got, I don't know if he got into his own head or if just the narrative surrounding what he needed to do got into his head this game. But he said something along those lines, and he wasn't quite as focused as he needed to be, or maybe he just bought into too much of the hype of, oh, I need to be, whatever it is that I need to be for us to win. And it ended up really costing the Warriors because he was certainly a net negative in game three and a pretty big one. I don't really remember a game that I thought was this bad all around. Honestly, in his playoff career, and not that I watch every single game that the Warriors play, but even as bad as game one was, he was just missing shots. I thought he did everything well everything else that game and in this game I didn't think he did anything well and you're right as a Draymond fan it was really tough to to watch him falter like that and I don't know that he cost the Warriors the game necessarily but he certainly didn't help and he was a a better Celtic than he was a Warrior no he definitely didn't cost the Warriors the game (laughs) I wouldn't say that I would not take it that far this was a team effort loss outside of Steph and maybe a little bit Clay, but Boston dominated this game. Boston played a free-flowing game of basketball, moving the ball really well, cut down on the turnovers, jumped up on the assists, were aggressive in the paint. But they only took, what, what were they, they took six shots in the paint in game two, I think, right? Something stupid like that. Some ridiculously low number of shots near the hoop in game two. They topped that by the end of the first quarter. So the, the Celtics were, were the aggressors, and they played smarter basketball as well. They had only... They, Under 15 turnovers, and we talked about the stats of what happens when they keep the turnovers under 15. The Warriors had way more turnovers. They had way less assists. They had way less rebounds. They had way less points in the paint. So all that added up together, that's a team loss, and the Boston Celtics just dominated you to a 16-point victory. This team is, is expected to be so good offensively. It's ridiculous. The... The numbers of the Golden State Warriors, of the number of times that they have been held to, quote-unquote, this low of offense. And by this low, we mean 101 points or less. We're not talking about 80 points or 90 points. They're still getting over 100 points. But if they have 101 points or less in the finals, they have lost every single time, all eight times, that they've only scored 101 points or less, they have lost in the finals. This is how their offense is expected to be so good is that it has to be such a high number. And if your defense is not doing its job and 101 points isn't getting done for you, then you need to work on something right now. And they need to work on playing as a team, moving the ball, getting assists, moving without the ball, doing whatever you can to shake this Celtic defense because right now you're being owned. And and even worse, you're being absolutely owned in the fourth quarter. The Celtics are what, plus 40 in the fourth quarter in this finals, Ryan? You cannot be minus 40 in the finals in the fourth quarter and expect to walk out the champion. You just can't. Well, no, you can't because if they weren't minus 40, they'd probably be 2-1 to one in, in this series. But they're not. They played the fourth quarter like pitifully poor in games one and three in game two they got up by so much that they just let the the backups in and the backups were able to fight it out to the point where the Celtics probably won the fourth quarter in game two as well but it certainly wasn't didn't have the same impact that it did in games one and in game three and for the Warriors I don't know I like I don't know what it is about the fourth quarter that they can't carry the momentum that they have over in the third quarter or what it is about the Celtics are they just saving up energy for the last 12 minutes of basketball to be like okay now is the time that we really get at it because neither strategy seems like it's it's all that smart we're just going to give up on the third quarter and then go ahead and dominate the fourth quarter and then for the Celtics or for the Warriors we're just going to punch you in the mouth in the third quarter and then lay down in the fourth like I don't understand why these two teams who 
you can argue that they're the two best teams in the NBA or not, but they're teams in the finals, and they're certainly two of the best four or five teams in the NBA. And they just can't put together, like, one consistent second. I don't understand it. I know that the other team is really good, too. But you got here by beating good teams. The Warriors, a little bit less so than the Celtics. But at this point in the season, you feel like either team would be able to have that figured out. And they're just, they're really just not. And I, I don't get it. I don't understand why. And it, I don't know, it upsets me. Okay. I just want a good game start to end. <laughs> you and me both, man. So after the game, Steve Kerr and Clay Thompson had some choice words for the Boston Celtics crowd. And I found this hilarious because I'm sitting there thinking back. And I'm like, yeah, Steve Kerr, he played for the Bulls. No, they didn't have to deal with the Celtics back in the 80s or like early 90s. And uh, his time with the Spurs, same thing. Obviously, they wouldn't have faced off unless it was in the finals. Uh, so he's never really had to deal with a Boston in the postseason. And Clay, obviously, he's been a warrior his whole time, so he wouldn't have had to unless it was in the NBA Finals. And it's, it's as a Pistons fan, <laughs> as a Laker fan, I know what to expect from the Boston crowd. They didn't do anything that surprised me. They didn't do anything that they've been doing for 40 years of basketball. <laughs> they are ruckus. They are ruthless. And... They don't care that you brought your kids to the game. Well, they don't what, care what, what, at what all. What other R word would you about this? <laughs> I don't know. Um, but they don't care that you brought your kid to the game. This is Boston. This is Philadelphia. This is New York. These are these kind of cities that the fans that follow these teams, I don't care how progressive the world gets. They are not going to stop swearing at you on the court, on the ice, on the diamond, on the field. <laughs> They're not. And so, to me, it was... To me, it's soft by Steve Kerr and Clay Thompson that they would actually so call soft. the Boston fans out for this because I'm sorry, but you have years of history to know what to expect. It's so soft and it's so weak, especially from a championship organization. You've been here how many times over the last eight years? And this is somehow a shock to you, like acting like you didn't get called a bitch in Cleveland or something. Like, I, it was, I was, honestly, I was shocked that this is what happened. Like, Steve Kerr played with Michael Jordan. This is a guy who would talk all, all the crap in the world to the other team. And I guarantee he was saying stuff that was worse than what the fans were chanting, chanting about Draymond. Like, in Clay Thompson, for I don't know, he just seems like a guy who doesn't seem not much bothers him except for, like, slights on his game. And I know he was upset he wasn't on the NBA 75 list. But other than that, he seems like he doesn't really care about outside noise so much. And it was soft. And if I'm – I am rooting for the Warriors, but if I was, like, an actual Warriors – fan like this would be more concerning to me than anything that i saw on the court is that they were so rattled by what how like something that is impossible not to expect even if you just watched winning time a month ago like how but did you not Clay thompson's how dad michael played for the lakers any of this coming michael thompson played on the lakers <laughs> i'm sure clay as a child was in the garden <laughs> for one of these games like you should know what to expect your dad should have talked to you about this i promise you michael thompson talked to clay once the finals were set and he knew they're facing boston i promise you michael as a former laker talked to clay about what to expect and why it is absolutely imperative that you beat these Celtics down. <laughs> yeah, and you don't let them get in your head because they're going to be chanting all types of stuff at you. And this the, the only thing you can give Draymond Green credit for in this game is that he was seemingly the only one who didn't come out and complain about about the crowd. I think he basically said something along the lines of, yeah, I expect it. What do you, what, what do you mean? And again, it was so it was so stupid and it was disappointing from an organization that I like and two guys that I like. I think Steve Kerr's a, a really good coach and obviously Clay Thompson's a great player. But this was this was amazingly crybabyish. All the things that they said after the press conference, just all the pearl clutching, and it reminded me of. Uh, Reverend Lovejoy's wife in The Simpsons. Does somebody think of the children? Like, it's just, it's so absurd. I, I hated every single minute of it. I can't believe they'd said it. Like, 
I thought it was something from you know, Ball Sack Sports or <laughs> that that fake Twitter thing is. And then I saw the actual clip, and it's just horrible. Yeah, I, this is just a disappointing night overall. Disappointing in Draymond and his game. Disappointment in Steve Kerr and Clay for their post game remarks. It's just overall, for a bunch of guys that I have a ton of respect for, I was very disappointed uh, in all three of them. And I agree with you though. That was the one thing Draymond said. He's like, it's not my job to respond to them. I expected that, but, and that was it. He let it, like that. It was done. And I, I understand coming to your your player and your teammates' defense, but Draymond didn't need Clay's defense there. He didn't need Steve Kerr's defense. He didn't there. need to. <laughs> all, yeah. All all you're doing is making you look, making yourself look so soft and in, in this what is already perceived as a soft day and age, life in general and sports as well. It just it definitely it it didn't help matters. You're, you're in Boston for crying out loud. This is a town that will absolutely fight and die over their sports teams. I'm sorry you're not used to it in San Francisco where like the fan base in California is a little bit different. There's wonderful things to do outside before you get to the game. In Boston, it sucks outside unless it's the summertime. So like all they want to do is get to a game to forget how bad it is outside. Like they, they live and die with their teams out there. And I'm sure if they went back to San Francisco and there was an F Marcus Smart chant, Steve Kerr does strike me as the kind of guy who would say, we don't want our fans to do that. So, sort of like Tom Izzo grabbing a mic and saying, hey, we're not doing that. Something along those lines. But it's, it's the same fan base that he, in, was it 2018 or whatever? LeBron's walking into the tunnel and they say, hey, LeBron, how's it feel to be a, a kitty ass bitch? <laughs> That's not the word they use. But, like, you get this in every fan base, so to act, again, just to act like it is something that's so new and unique to Boston. I think Boston can can get a bad rap. Some of it is deserved. I think more of it is deserved than maybe even people want to acknowledge. But this, is, no, like, every single fan base in the country would do this. Especially given the situation. It's not a regular season game. This is the finals. April. Like, this is the finals. Like, you should be expecting this. Huh, okay. So Ryan, we, we talked the other week about Steph's legacy. If he gets the fourth ring, how many more can he get? All that. But there's a side to it we haven't discussed. And it's if he loses. And now he's 3-3 three and three in the NBA Finals. And more importantly, he is 1-3 in the NBA Finals without Kevin Durant. And... He's never won a finals MVP. For the two finals with Kevin Durant, the majority of people would say he wasn't the best player on the team and that Kevin Durant was. So if Steph goes to 3-3 three and three in the NBA Finals after losing this finals to the Boston Celtics, where is his legacy now? I think it's in the same place. I know it's a, a boring answer, but I still think he's the, the second best player point guard ever and you can do the context thing you can even just say that he's one in three without Kevin Durant but in one of the series he obviously didn't have Kevin Durant and didn't have Clay Thompson and that was the final version of that Kevin Durant Warriors team that had sacrificed the most depth and if you're gonna like that Warriors team we saw I think the next year didn't even make the playoffs I know Steph was hurt but KD left they still didn't have Clay Thompson and without Steph, they weren't even close to a playoff team. They got the number two pick in the NBA draft and drafted James Wiseman, who we haven't seen touch a basketball at all, it seems like, in these two or three years since he's been drafted. Uh, the other one was obviously the 3-1 blown lead. And then this one would be one where, again, it like Steph himself has put up some incredible numbers. I think he's averaging 31 points on 49, 49, and 83% from the free throw line, which is unbelievable splits. It's just not en enough to get it done when he's got these th these guys next to him not performing. And we went through it when we were talking about what his legacy does mean is a lot of these great all-time point guards don't have a whole lot to their name. Now, I think Oscar Robertson has one title. Chris Paul obviously doesn't have any. John Stockton doesn't have any. Jason Kidd has one, but much later in his career where he certainly wasn't the, the main guy on the team. Um, Steve Nash doesn't have any rings. So you start to go through the list and you're saying like, okay, who can we bump Steph below if he doesn't get this 
NBA championship. And there's really not a list. Like, sure, you can throw them below Isaiah Thomas if you wanted to. And then Stefan and Isaiah are my two and three, and Magic's already number one. But for me, I think if he loses, he's still in the tier that he's in. And he's still in that tier even if he wins. So there's the guys who are like Kobe, MJ, LeBron, and Tracy McGrady just came out and said it. He said, Steph's not in the class of Kobe, MJ, and LeBron. And I don't think anybody thinks he really is, but I think he's in that tier below where you're going to look at a guy. I think he's probably better than Dwayne Wade. So maybe not that. Um, I don't know. It's just a weird class with a Larry Bird. And I don't know that this title automatically makes him better than Larry Bird. And I don't know that if he lost, it'd automatically be worse than than a guy like Larry Bird, uh, Akeem Olajuwon, whoever you want to say. And I think whether he wins or loses this title in specific, he's still in that class. I think only winning more will obviously elevate him above, but I don't think losing this title necessarily knocks him down into that third tier with maybe a Dwayne Wade, Dirk Nowitzki, Kevin Garnett, somebody like that. Mm -hmm. So I think he's in that weird tier two where it's almost just him, honestly. (laughs) But maybe well, not. There's probably it, a couple of It depends where, where, where other uh, people are. Tier two and a half, maybe. Yeah. It's where people have their other, you know, superstars in the similar realm. As, as far as the point guard situation, that's... It's, he's kind of pretty much set where he is right now. Argument of two, three, all time in the point guard position. The shooting stuff, best shooter I've ever seen, all that stuff, that's great. It's the overall superstar career. And now we are looking at... Oh, you just named a lot of the guys. And that's more of... If you're four and two... And one of those losses is, right? Hang on, are our numbers correct here? He, he'd be four and two if he, yeah, he, he'd be four and two if he won. Right. Because he lost he with lost the KD, okay. or he lost the KD team to the Raptors and then he lost to the Cavs. Right. So if you're four and two and one loss is an absolute travesty stolen by the NBA, and the other is an absolute travesty stolen by the health of your two other, you know, major superstars. Because I fully believe that that Warriors team, 100% healthy, I think beats the Raptors in six or seven. I'd like to have seen that play out, but KD wasn't and Clay wasn't. Clay went down as well, and it definitely. Oh, and nine, oh yeah, in nineteen absolutely. Yeah, but yeah, absolutely. You, you look at the names of the, of the list that he's trying to become a part of. You look at the accolades of a Magic Johnson, of a Larry Bird, of a Kobe Bryant, of a LeBron James, of a Tim Duncan. You look at the number of titles and MVPs and, in some cases, changing the game. Other cases, just being just great in their position. And three, I, I don't know how you have him. I don't, know you have, I don't know how you have him above Larry. I don't know how you have him above Larry Bird. At, th- at three and three, Bird was three and two. So yeah, he went to the finals. One more. And we're talking about two of the greatest shooters to ever do it. Bird didn't do it for as long, obviously. Man broke his back very early in his career, but still was one of the best to ever touch a basketball, ever step on a court. And for a guy like Curry, who has a bunch of years left, and he flat he came out recently and said it, that he thinks he's in his prime right now. Like the beginning of the peak time period where he feels like he's got a bunch of years to still be in that peak. We'll see. But... That's just not true. I think, I think it hurts not being four and two, uh, losing to the Celtics. One, there's things that are out of your control in the past that you can't do anything about. For those finals, so the first finals they won, LeBron was without Kyrie and, and Kevin Love, and so people are going to talk about that one there. And then obviously, seventeen and eighteen, they, they were just ridiculous. Him and KD together should not be allowed. It was so, it was too good. <laughs> but there's just. There's so many little pieces around Steph's legacy. I, I just think, obviously, you'd rather be 4-2. But I think for his actual legacy, I think winning this series will mean a lot in the long run. I See, I still because, like, so if he wins, he, he's still not, like, in the Kobe class. You probably don't have him above Tim Duncan. And then him and Larry Bird is a closer conversation. And I think that's just where it starts. And even if he loses this series... It doesn't change the context of the other two series that he lost, where he lost without KD and then, uh, note that they blew the 3-1 series, with somebody like you thinks, hey, it's because the NBA intervened and they should have won that one. So I'm not sure. 
how much that changes the narrative of it. I think a lot of it can just fall into recency bias because he's not the same guy that we've seen b- before. I don't, th- I don't think he's in his prime. He's still very good, but the prime Steph Curry was like one of the best offensive players who's ever we've ever seen. And I guess he's still that just not to the same kind of level that, that he was at. So if you're going to look at that and then you talk about, okay, we won with the golden state warriors when he was with KD, a lot of, so before that comparing him with a guy like Larry bird, right? Because we said his name a bunch, Larry bird played on a team that a lot of people consider the greatest team of all time too. But because we're so far removed from it, they're just, okay, they're the 86 Celtics and they won a title. Nobody's like, yeah, but too bad that they had a super team. Sorry, Larry, that one doesn't count. And if Steph loses, because people are going to be looking to, people are just going to be looking into his legacy, good, bad, otherwise. And there's a lot of people that don't like uh, Steph Curry that are certainly going to be looking to devalue what he did. They're going to say, okay, but you won yours with Kevin Durant, so now you're not any Larry Bird. And their careers are fairly close. Steph is eight-time All-NBA. Larry Bird is 10. By the time Steph's done, I bet he'll be at least 10. Does he have two more years? Especially because part of it's like media voting. I would assume he gets two more All-NBAs. First team, whatever or not. Steph has two MVPs. Larry Bird has three. They both have three rings. Bird has two finals MVPs. Um... And well, who is Maxwell? Another one, right? The one that was talking all that trash to, to Draymond. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and then Steph, eight time All Star, and Larry Bird was a 12 time All Star. Again, I think every year that Steph plays from now on, except maybe his last year, if he's just really bad, he's going to make an All Star team. So their career accolades are going to be close. Um, and they had, like you said, Larry Bird had the, had the broken back. Um, Steph injured his ankle, obviously, early earlier in his career so maybe he could have an extra all nba i don't think he would have won mvp or anything crazy but he couldn't have an extra all nba or an extra all-star game whatever it was on his resume as well so i think they'll fairly be close if steph wins this title and a finals mvp then i think you probably have a better argument to switch him in front of larry bird anybody else though i don't know that he's already not better than and if he loses this i don't know that this necessarily makes him worse than anybody else in that class and maybe just because we're hyper focused on larry bird and i have the numbers and accolades and stuff in front of me but it seems like that's the best comparison and for how his event how his career might pan out towards the end this is probably the the closest Larry only played 13 years in the NBA and Steph is in his 12th year right now. So Steph's obviously going to have more longevity than what Larry had, which might make some of his, some of his all all time numbers end up like eclipsing Mm -hmm. whatever bird did. If, if you're only talking about one spot on the all time ranking, I don't know how much it necessarily hurts his legacy, but there'll be certainly be a lot of talk about it only because it's, you know, recent and we're so far enough gone from it that, yeah, that's just what gets you know talked about. A lot of these teams yeah. had quote unquote super teams, whether it's Kareem, Magic, and like James Worthy, who eventually comes on later. I think maybe in twenty or thirty years, people are going to just see Steph Curry. They're going to see the three rings if that's what he ends up with. If they win this one, they're going to see four, and that's just what it's going to be. They're going to say, oh, "Yeah, those were some great teams," but they're not going to start taking away titles like they are going to, especially if the Warriors lose this series. Yeah, a lot of this, it's not Steph's fault. He unquestionably should have been the finals MVP of 2015. If you're not going to give it to LeBron, who just had the more ridiculous numbers and make him the second ever besides Jerry West to be finals MVP while losing because his numbers were just far and away better than everybody's. But if you're taking from the winning side, it should have been Steph. uh, And that one was stolen from him. And then KD comes. And in one of them, it was no question. KD deserved the finals MVP in the other one. It was absolutely a coin toss to me. You know, I know KD had a little more, a few more points and some more rebounds, but Steph's stats, like I said early in another show, you are never going to find a better stat line on the winning team that didn't win finals MVP than what Steph put up. I think it was the second one, right? The, the second one they won together 
was the one that uh, yeah. Steph was putting up like 29 points, 8 and 8 or something like that. There's just some things that aren't Steph's fault. And obviously, KD coming helped Steph's career. It helped him win another title, two more titles, made sure of that. I'm sure Steph is not mad that Kevin Durant joined the Golden State Warriors. But in the long run of his legacy, you say that Larry Bird was a part of a super team as well. But Larry Bird was the unquestioned best player on that super team. It wasn't Kevin McHale. Yes. It wasn't Robert Parrish. 81, apparently. <laughs> Cedric Maxwell in, out here. In 80, yeah, in 81, they, they weren't quite that super team yet. <laughs> but I don't, that's still also ridiculous. Maxwell had a nice series, but still, I don't know how Larry Bird doesn't win that one either. But it's just talking points. Obviously, it's something that's going to come up. Win or lose this series, it's going to be something that's brought up in the offseason. Some that, you know, us... Us fans and talking heads like to bring up when we're talking about the greatest of all time. And Curry is absolutely one of them. Where is he on that list? All right. <clears throat> That's going to do it for this show. Next time we talk to you, it will be right before game five. Right? Because game four is Friday. And then Monday. Uh, sorry. Fr fr Jesus, Monday. And then Saturday, Sunday. Uh, maybe Monday. We, it might be after game five. Ryan. It's, it's probably after. Yeah, it's probably after Game 5. So where are we after Game 5? Oh, man. I don't know. I will say 3-2 Warriors. I think they get Game 4. I think they take Game 5 at home. And then Game 6, I think the Celtics probably win. And then it comes down to it in Game 7. Dubs in 7. Yeah, I don't know. I'm not feeling so confident. <laughs> Just, I'm not liking what I'm seeing from the Warriors not named Steph Curry. So I'm going to say 3-2 Celtics as much as I hope you are. Just... Well, Crybaby Clay said they were down 2-1 in 2015. Mm -hmm. Look how that turned out. Uh, yeah, the Celtics team was a heck of a lot better than one man LeBron show in Cleveland. All right, he's Ryan Griffin. I'm Matt Basson. We're throwing stones. Thank you for hanging out with us. We'll see you guys again real soon.